All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Hiro Camacho, and I am part of the product, the console product marketing team here at HashiCorp. Thanks, everyone, so much for tuning in and spending part of your morning with us. So today we are joined by Usha Kadali, uh, product manager on the console team, along with Gordon McKinney and Peter Schramm, uh, principal platform engineers from Comcast, who will be sharing their experiences running console on ECS. Uh, no need to worry, we'll be recording this presentation and making it available later on in the coming days. Um, feel free to drop any questions you might have in the chat. We'll do our best to answer them as we go along or address them later on when we get to the Q&A section. So to get us started, I'll provide a quick overview of Amazon Web Services Elastic Containers Service. So Amazon ECS is a container orchestrator. <clears throat> it allows users to take containers like Docker images and run them in the cloud. It's very similar in terms of functionality to Kubernetes or Nomad. But what really differentiates ECS is its emphasis on simplicity. And while that means it doesn't have the robust feature catalog as Kubernetes, it does make it a lot easier to get started and run things. Now, what does this process look like on AWS? Well, the image is stored in the Amazon Elastic Container Registry. It's then submitted to Amazon ECS. Then a decision needs to be made about um, where to run it. So Fargate and ECS deployment launch mode is one of the most popular options. It has no underlying services users can access as it's a service, serviceless compute engine. Currently, console supports both the Fargate and EC2 as launch types using the AWS ECS Terraform module. In the future, AWS CDK module will be available as another option for users. Now let's take a look at a sample application running on ECS. Here's our sample ECS cluster. It's populated with two microservice applications, our client service and our service service. Now let's walk through the request path for a simple action, a user accessing their profile via website. So the website is loaded via the ALB sitting directly outside the cluster. Once it's taken you to the task running on the front end, then it still needs to load that profile. And to do so, it needs to make an API call over to the service hosting the profile service, which is routed through the internal ALB. Now, this represents a relatively like standard way of running things on ECS. But if we were to take a step back and look at this architecture, depending on the needs of an organization, there might be certain aspects that they would like to augment. Um, perhaps they have a recent mandate to bolster security, um, they wanna gain more insight into their performance or simply want better control over the flow of traffic. Now, let's explore how incorporating console uh, as a service mesh could help them meet these requirements. So here we have console running as a service mesh on ECS. Um, it can be ran as self-managed on EC2 VMs or managed using HCP console. Uh, on each microservice application, there is a console client running alongside uh, Envoy Sidecar. Now, the client is used to control things while the sidecars act as proxies to help handle communication between services. So using console as your service mesh on ECS can help address three critical use cases, um, facilitating zero trust networking. So encrypting requests between tasks with MTLS, this prevents attackers from sniffing plain text traffic also, since requests flow through sidecar proxies, console can block requests from unauthorized services, uh, enhancing observability. So sidecar proxies can be configured to emit consistent request metrics between all of your services, allowing you to build dashboards and create automated alerts without reconfiguring and recoding all of your services. And finally, improved reliability. So console's configuration uh, entries can be used to configure the behavior of proxies to retry fail requests, timeout after a certain period of time, and circuit break services that are not responding. Uh, these controls can increase the reliability of your microservice infrastructure without requiring changes to the underlying services. So now I'm gonna pass it along to Usha so we can learn a bit more about what's on the horizon for console on ECS. Usha? Thanks, Hiro. The next slide. Yes, now uh, we'll just go into the journey of uh, console on ECS. It started um, with a tech preview in May this year and with a recent beta release in September. Um, so we, with the tech preview, um, as you just heard, uh, we did about um, Fargate uh, on ECS. 
and it, it and it supported a non-secure deployment. With our beta release, um, we supported both EC, ECS tasks, um, EC2 and Fargate, as well as a secure deployment. And we are looking forward to releasing general availability this November and more agile releases in the future. So we can look at the roadmap as to what features were supported. Next slide. And here is the roadmap of the features that we released and, and that are upcoming. In tech preview, I would like to, um, no, not in the tech preview, in, uh, in beta, I would like to focus on uh, some of the highlighted features. If you could just go to the next slide, let me just focus on, yeah, the, singular, the secure single um, DC service mesh. So here with um, console service mesh, um, enables defense in depth security mechanisms using access uh, controlless transport layer security and gossip encryption. So this way you can be rest assured that um, there is zero trust for your um, service mesh. And also um, as Hiro just mentioned, you can deploy console servers uh, using HCP, which is our um, HashiCorp cloud platform. It is a fully managed uh, platform which would and which will let you deploy console clients on, EC, on ECS. And console clients on ECS Fargate and EC2 are supported with beta. And now with GA, next slide. And with GA, we will be supporting health checks. So while beta supports health checks, native health checks on, con on console, the health checks on ECS we will be able to sync those onto console so that you don't have to run your uh, health checks twice for console and for ECS. So this way there will be one single source of truth. And also with our Amazon partnership, we are uh, um, developing a CDK support so to um, employ your uh, CDK workflows. And also for scalability, uh, we'll, uh, we are uh, focusing on some performance um, uh, testing so we can help with, uh, we can provide some guidance on resources on the containers. And in the future, for the future, next slide. Um, yeah, so the future of console on ECS. So we have plenty of features that are already supported with beta and um, with GA. And in the future, um, we'll be focusing on uh, supporting different type of gateways, ingress, terminating and mesh along with other uh, features like namespaces, network segments, um, vault integration. Um, so let me just focus a little bit on the gateway support itself. While you'll see that with um, Comcast, you can deploy these gateways today, but it's we will be um, supporting it in a very native way. So you don't have to do some leg, uh, some leg work on your own. So I, I just want to call, call it out that uh, Today, um, you, you should be able to get your uh, mesh gateways across uh, regions, supporting deployments across regions and also terminating gateways. So uh, with that, I would um, like to hand off to, uh, to Comcast, um, but prior to that, I would encourage folks to uh, log into Learn Tutorial. So Learn Tutorial has a really good, um, material on, um, e on ease of deployment. So you can actually uh, try, try it yourself uh, with HCP deployments on, on ECS. And um, now to our friends at Comcast to learn more about their experiences using console on AWS ECS. First off, thank you to HashiCorp for setting this up and thanks to everyone for attending. Gordon and I are platform engineers at Comcast in the Connected Living Organization. We're excited to be here to talk about what we've been doing with Console Connect, Service Mesh, and ECS. We've learned a lot over our journey and we hope everyone here can learn something from us. Connected Living, our motto is connected, protected, simple. We manage uh, hardware and applications that run them. Uh, the linchpin of our setup is the Xfinity managed Wi-Fi access points. This is the key to the home and it enables everything else we do. We have over 70 million of these deployed. 
The next piece of our ecosystem is the Xfinity app. This facilitates device activation and management. You can manage and monitor your Wi-Fi with the Xfinity app. You can see your connected devices and you can pause devices on your network. We also offer Wi-Fi threat detection and mitigation through our access points. It protects your devices from accidentally accessing no malicious sites. It can also monitor your network in real time and detect when devices are behaving unusually. You can get notifications about these types of scenarios in the Xfinity app. Another product we have are our Wi-Fi mesh network pods. These are helped to extend your network and eliminate dead spots. We have cameras as well. We can do live video recording that you can view through the app from anywhere. You can also upgrade to 24 seven recording so you can see what you've missed and review activity through AI that can detect people, vehicles, and pets. We have home security, both pro-monitored and self-monitored, and we also provide home automation. Connected living, who are we? We have 500 engineering teammates in connected living. We have hundreds of microservices and 50 squads. Uh, we're part of the greater technology product and experience team that has 12,000 staff. Why console? We went with console because we needed to support cloud and on-premises workloads. Console can support both. It's not tied to a single cloud or platform. We needed this flexibility for our solution. It's also easy to set up multiple data centers and federate across them. We're in multiple AWS regions and in our own data centers. We also needed to scale. Comcast makes it, our console makes it easy to run the mesh at the scale we need to. It has the resiliency we need and it can handle our environment's complexity. What business problems are we trying to solve? We need responsible, responsive multi-regional failover and routing. In AWS, redundancy in a single region is pretty easy, but it becomes much harder across multiple regions. How do we handle failures and route traffic accordingly in a seamless and automated fashion? Console allows us to do that. We need increased observability with the console UI and Datadog with tracing. Console UI, Console Connect UI can easily show us the topology and intentions between our services, and we have native integrations with Datadog so we can monitor all of those services. We also get faster and cheaper deployments. Deployments become faster and cheaper because we're simplifying the services and relying on the mesh for service discovery and routing. We can also reduce our networking complexity by simplifying our needs for firewall rules and access policies and allowing the service mesh to handle these concerns. What technical problems does a service mesh solve? No more load balancers. Services are discovered through the mesh. We don't need to load balance them and we have more advanced routing capabilities for those services. We don't need to worry about TLS certificate rotation, the mesh, handles that, console connects, signs certs, and rotates them automatically. And we don't need reverse proxies to bridge our networks. Those are some of the main things. We also get you know, this, the same things all meshes provide, discovery, circuit, circuit breakers, traffic shaping, and layer seven access policies. Automatic certificate rotation. We're using Vault as our route. The Vault route signs our intermediates. Each data center gets an intermediate cert, and each, each intermediate cert signs the leaf certs for the microservices. These are rotated automatically. The root gets rotated every 90 days, intermediates get rotated every year, and leaf certs have a three-day rotation. We can also force a rotation or reconfigure the certificate setup and rotate it automatically. What does our architecture look like? We are running, sorry, we're running in multiple AWS regions with multiple VPCs in those regions across many accounts. The VPCs are on the same network and they're joined by transit, transit gateways. They're also connected back to Comcast data centers. 
The transit gateways are keeping all the AWS traffic in AWS, and they only send traffic across the direct connects if it needs to go back to Comcast. What does failover look like in this situation? Here we have service A talking to service B in one region. If service B is down in that region, the mesh will automatically fail over traffic to the other region. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Gordon for his demo. Thank you, Pete. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so before we uh, touch upon demo, let's talk about some of the requirements we had from our service owners. And now it's worth pointing out that um, Comcast has been on this journey for about a year and a half, and we've been uh, onboarding services throughout this year. Um, for that reason, we've had to craft some of our own uh, entry point, uh, Docker entry point script uh, logic to make everything happen. And some of the requirements we got from our service owners was they'd like an immutable Docker image. What that means is they want to have the same Docker image for any service deployed anywhere. So we took that challenge and what we decided to do was to pass the client.json, the configuration that console needs to spin itself up. We pass it in via an environment variable and we'll see that in a minute. ECS uh, Fargate tasks also uh, get assigned an ENI when they're launched. Now, typically you don't know about that because you put a load balancer in front and everything's good, but <clears throat> Console removes a need for load balancers. And in doing so, we had to detect the ENI. It turns out that uh, AWS makes it available on a metadata URL, and you can use JQ to go and extract the IP from the DOM. And we also use the IP address uh, to mark a unique node name. We'll touch on that again in a minute. And one of the other requirements we got was, hey, could we make it the uh, image uh, auto detect the region that it's running in? That way, the service owner doesn't have to change their client configuration, depending on whether they're in East or West or wherever. So we took all of these requirements and built ourselves a Docker entry point um, with, with those capabilities. We're working very closely with Usha uh, to share some of the findings that we found, some of the requirements we've got, so that they can start to add that to their open source uh, uh, code, which you'll all be able to consume. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's start with a task definition. By the way, this is not a live demo, uh, partly because I hate live demos uh, for the risk of them going wrong, but mostly because there's some secure information that I can't show you uh, during the presentation. It was just easier to uh, redact it via screenshots. So here's a task definition that we've got. Um, you'll see, very importantly, network mode, AWS VPC. That's required for console and Envoy to work correctly. And we said we'd like it to run on Fargate. Fargate has some advantages over EC2, uh, specifically around security. Uh, whenever you're launching a task on Fargate, you're getting the latest hardened Amazon image. Whereas if you launch on EC2, you're responsible for patching the operating system and upgrading the AMIs. So Fargate provides kind of the best of both worlds. You still have concurrency like you have with EC2, but you don't have to do any image maintenance, which is pretty cool. Next slide. Okay, so here are the container definitions within this task definition. So we'll start at the bottom. So test service, um, this uses Nicholas Jackson's fake service, which is a really cool image. Uh, it can actually simulate uh, latency. So if you wanna simulate one of your services that takes half a second to respond, fake service can do that, which is a really great way to spin up a test environment for doing some load and stress. We also use Datadog uh, at in Connected Living. Um, we use it for all our monitoring, alerts, alarms, anomaly detection. It's a fantastic product. Uh, we love it. And then here we have the two sidecars that make service mesh work. We have the agent. That's the console binary running as a client agent. It does all the control plane activity from the slides you saw earlier. And then you have the Envoy proxy. That's responsible for moving uh, the traffic between nodes in the service mesh and for doing NTLS handshake and verification. And you notice in both cases, it is exactly the same image. And we follow the uh, console version number standard and we add a fourth dot, which represents any iterations we do within the container beyond the binaries that we're running. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so let's have a look at the service mesh agent. So the first thing to note is the command. We pass in console agent. And our entry point script recognizes that and says, oh, okay, I need to launch console. Well, I know console needs a few extra command line arguments. And you'll see how that's expanded in the bottom here. So we say, okay, we receive console agent. So we'll set dash client, which says, hey, any API calls to the console agent are restricted to local host. We set the advertise, that's really important. That lets everybody in the service mesh, whatever region they're in, whatever data center, uh, it lets them know the IP address to reach this node. Now that has some other advantages just beyond removing load balances. We actually have a use case where um, a uh, service would like to reach one of their ECS Fargate tasks and instantiate a long lived connection in the order of hours. And that's impossible through an AWS load balancer. In fact, uh, almost all of AWS infrastructure has very limited uh, time to live for connections. So this advertise, the service discovery element is critical for some of our use cases. And that's not using Envoy in that instance, but it is using console's control plane to uh, get the address. Now, we have the node here, uh, which is the service name followed by the IP address in hex. And the reason we did that was A, uniqueness, but B, uh, we needed to keep the node name 63 characters or less. Otherwise, it, it breaks the DNS standard for a, um, a host name. Data center. Remember uh, one of our requirements, we had to be able to auto detect which region we're running in and point the client at the right server cluster. So here we say data center US East 1. And then retry join also lets it know which uh, you know, A records, IP addresses to find the server nodes. In this case, we're using root 53. Uh, obviously, I've redacted a little bit of that, but root 53 says, hey, here's the 3A records for this region's server cluster, and then the console agent's able to connect, find out who the leader is, and it runs from there. Okay, so port mappings. You need to open up 8301, and that allows the gossip protocol to function between um, the uh, nodes. Next, uh, we have the client JSON uh, configuration. So here, what we've done is we've taken the JSON, We've gzipped it and then base64 encoded it. Now, some of you may be looking at that wondering what would happen if you decode it. The fact is I've put some gibberish in there, so there's no point in spending the effort, but that's what the block looks like. It's about the right size and it allows us to pass the tokens and the configuration required for the console agent to do its job. And the last thing to note is the U limits. The default U limit for ECS Fargate is 1024 soft and 4096 hard for the uh, file limit. Um, that's too low. That's not high enough for console and envoy to function. So we've set those both to 64K. Next slide, please. So uh, this uh, task definition, this, sorry, container definition uh, launches console connect. Uh, console connect, uh, you can specify uh, the envoy process to run the proxy of traffic. Um, in this case, our start script also looks at this and says, okay, I need to add sidecar four and I'm gonna do log level error. Sidecar four uh, specifies the service definition within the console agent to um, activate. Uh, and our little start script actually goes and queries that from the console agent. So it makes it fully automatic. Again, we wanted to make this as easy as possible for our service owners. We expose a host port of 21,000 this is so Envoy can communicate. Normally Envoy wants 21,000 to 21,255, but realistically you have one listener per application. And with ECS Fargate, you only have one microservice. So we only expose one port. Again, U limits, 64K a piece. Uh, failure to do that um, change would cause Envoy to misbehave when it starts to scale up and handle more connections. Next slide, please. So here is our production console UI. You can see some services here, it's growing by the day. Uh, what's great about this is you can see how many instances, whether they're in the mesh of the proxy and so on and so forth. Um, you can also see some of our terminating gateways in there as well. Now, one of the neat features about the console production UI is uh, the little um, dropdown on the top left says US East 1. We can select any one of our regions from that little dropdown and see the services running in that region. Well, initially, that doesn't seem like a great feature until you have one of our direct connects disable between um, Comcast and that AWS region. 
When that happens, we can't reach that region directly. And that could be for any reason, fiber cut, firewall change, any reason. Um, so what console does, because it's got the WAN gossip protocol and all the clusters are talking um, to each other, we can actually go into a region that is still connected and then select the region we can't reach normally and still view our services. So from an administrative uh, perspective, it gives us great resiliency as admin operators. It's also the same functionality that allows services to see each other across multiple regions and fail over to each other. So it's, uh, it's really the console concept working at scale. It helps us in a practical sense and it helps us service hours. Next slide. So here's an example of um, the SatCash service. Uh, it has three clients using it, control, int, load and stress, and profile int. Now you'll notice we say int here and stage on the right. We actually run integration and production services on the production console cluster. It makes things easier for our service owners. It proves everything's working the way it should. And really the only difference from the service owner is they change the name of their client configuration for their production deployment, which of course they code into their task definition. I should point out here, uh, ECS Fargate task definitions can support values as you've seen, uh, you know, pasted into the uh, task definition. It also supports value from to pull it from parameter store. So you can have a secure store for any of those uh, values. Um, now, one of the things not shown on this diagram uh, is the lines you see going to the services. R right now, they're just gray lines. There's nothing else on them. When you first set up a dependency for a service, there's a little X. And that little X represents an intention that's not allowed, it's denied by default. And what we do for a deployment is when someone says, hey, I've just launched a service, either they self-service or us as admins go in and click that little X to turn that intention into an allow, which is great. That's layer seven um, micro segmentation and security at, at work and it's visual and it's easy to use. There's an intentions tab too, which actually gives you some more details. You can actually say layer seven um, HDB header rules as well for those intentions. So there's a lot to unpack there, but it's one of the features we like and one of the features our security team likes a lot. It takes us above simple uh, layer four security. Clearly bearer tokens are a way to control access, but the service mesh prevents requests moving between services that are not allowed, which is even better. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about failover uh, uh, quite a bit. One of the things about uh, writing microservices, if you do want to support failover semantics, you've got to have an, a library or an HTTP client and some configuration and a whole bunch of stuff, and you've got to maintain that. And if there's a, 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 an outage and you haven't foreseen a failover scenario, you'd have to redeploy the application potentially to go change the failover behavior. Well, with the service mesh, Envoy's doing all the work and console's controlling uh, what Envoy does. So we can deploy this stanza into the service mesh cluster to say, hey, for the pepper breeze stage service, we have a connect time at 15 seconds and here's the failover. So what happens is if you can't reach that service in your local region, then it will attempt the other data centers listed here. And you can see the asterisk meaning all. So <clears throat> that's really powerful for a few reasons. One, we can change this on the fly if we need to in an emergency. Uh, two, connect timeout that actually detects gray failures. So that's where your service is up, maybe running slow and maybe unable to handle a connection within a certain timeout. Well, we're instructing Envoy here to say, hey, look, if you can't reach that service within 15 seconds, treat it as offline and move on. And that's in addition to console's own health checking of those services. So that gives us a really neat way to define on a post-service basis, failover rules and the ability to change them anytime. Next slide, please. Okay, one thing I wanna call out, we're all hands-on, you can see our happy smiley faces there on the bottom right. Um, we found it really useful to create our own repo using, uh, and you can see various experiments here with Docker Compose configurations uh, that allows us to spin up an entire cluster, do some testing, play with the configuration, improve our own understanding. Uh, and you can see some of the experiments we've done there. So I strongly recommend that if you start playing with console, uh, definitely take the time, spin it up, have a look, there's a, a lot of value to that. And on the next page, let's go to the next slide. We'll see uh, an example of that. On the file left, we have a compose up, launch a whole bunch of containers, it only takes a few seconds, which is great. Uh, bottom right, you can see us using the console CLI. 
and it works just the same as it would in production. I mean, this is exactly the experience we have in production, but it's on a local machine and we can tinker it to our heart's content. And then at the top there, you can see the uh, UI from this local cluster. Um, and we can see here, we're doing an experiment on shifting traffic to the shipping calculator and we're splitting it between version one and version two of that shipping calculator. And we can change the percentages from 0, 100, uh, 80, 20, 50, 50, and so on and so forth. So this is a really great way for us to understand a whole bunch of stuff about console in a very safe and quick turnaround environment. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'll hand back to Pete as we uh, touch on our closing uh, thoughts. Thank you, Gordon. So what have we learned through this experience? We've learned how to obtain ECS Fargate 1.4 task ENI addresses. We need those IP addresses to register the services properly with console. We also learned that the no file U limit defaults were insufficient and we need to tune them. Another thing we learned is that the console gossip protocol requires many to many security group relationships. Every service needs to be able to talk to every other service in the mesh. We worked with our Com Comcast cloud team to automate those many to many relationships. This greatly simplified our firewall and network access policies for microservices in our service mesh, and it's automated centrally. Uh, every service gets the same firewall rules and it's automated, so it's very easy. What's next for us? We're gonna continue onboarding more services. Uh, we're excited about this. The teams are really excited about this. Um, it makes that so much easier for service to service communication. Um, we're also working with HashiCorp on an AWS Lambda mesh interoperation. We wanna simplify the process of adding Lambda-based services to the mesh. So we're collaborating on a solution for that. We're gonna be deploying to more data centers. We're making our services available in the EU. We have bought Sky and we're rolling out data centers there. Also, as we add on-premises services, we'll be expanding to console clusters in data centers at Comcast. Thank you very much. And now it's time for some Q&A. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Gordon. Um, fantastic presentation. So we have four questions here in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> the first one being, uh, can Comcast IAM be running Google Cloud Platform, Terraform, Kubernetes Pod, Atomic Region, and AWS ECS parallelly with IP address, IP address size with Spring, Java, Kotlin, syntax for necessary data? Sounds like a, a HashiCorp question. Um, Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, I don't know if we can have them, have them clarify, or, but I'm not sure. Yeah, if that anonymous attendee could potentially rephrase and we'll come back to it later on. Um, second question. So um, how does Service Mesh IP and HashiCorp Cloud Platform with GCP spin up parallelly for frequent variants in data at distributed browsers? <clears throat> That's another one I'm not sure about. Um, I'm not sure what the last part of that for frequent variance in data distributed browser means. Um, sorry. Okay. Yeah, we can uh, come back to that one later on. <clears throat> so, um, how does console? Uh, how is console service mapped to AWS ECS port address when we are developing with same port address in Google Cloud Platform region? So if I understand that correctly, uh, and I'm not a GCP expert, but the ports um, uh, of the service are contained to just the uh, service itself. So you could use port 8000 over here and port 8000 over there. It doesn't matter because Envoy is the one moving the traffic. Now, if you're referring to console port numbers um, for, say, gossip protocol, then yes, it's the same port, but it's tied to each individual instance. and having cross cloud gossip protocols not recommended. I'm sure HashiCorp can agree with that. 
what we've done is between regions, we actually use the WAN gossip protocol to talk between these server clusters, as you saw per region. So hopefully that answers that question. All right. Thank you, Gordon. Um, <clears throat> next question. So what challenges uh, did you have to overcome to get the software engineering teams on board with console? Um, so the challenges we've had um, initially are, you know, folks find a service mesh um, uh, kind of a foreign concept. So there's a little bit of resistance and understanding, you know, why that's important and valuable. And as they go through the journey, they start to see some of the benefits, uh, especially when things aren't running right, you know, when there's actual problems. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is Comcast networking is very, very complex. Um, uh, there's a lot of procedures, a lot of security, a lot of firewall rules, uh, a lot of bridging points. It's very, very complicated. So one of the things we're asking teams to do is to move into a certain class of VPC that Comcast has created, which is an overlay on top of Amazon, um, which that creates a little bit of work for teams. But when they do, they suddenly gain all the benefits of the automation we've created around uh, service mesh. And that suddenly unlocks all the capabilities. They no longer have to worry about contacting this team and that team to get things set up. Our team and the service mesh has automated that. So now they just put a little service definition in their uh, configuration and say, I want to use this service and the rest is magic as far as they're concerned. And that includes jumping out of um, the sandbox and into uh, non-managed VPCs uh, for legacy services, terminating gateway, ingress gateway, our own API gateway are all plugged into the service mesh allowing teams to worry less about how traffic gets to them and gets to other services. And they just focus on writing their service and uh, um, accessing those other services. I awesome. Think, I think, sorry. sorry, I think education is a big part of it. Getting the teams to understand the benefits. No one wants to do more work. They're on tight deadlines, but being able to explain to them how this helps them in the long run with a little bit of pain, <clears throat> excuse me, up front. And also I think the work that Gordon did with the, the container, making it pretty easy for them. You know, they can put in their, they can put in their token, they can run these containers with their services. There's not a lot of change on their end to get them up and running. So we, we've done a lot to educate and then also help them with the implementation. All right, got another one here for the Comcast, Comcast team. Um, so how do you manage console configurations? Is it managed as a code? Is it part of the microservice, et cetera? Yeah, so the configuration, uh, anyone who's seen it, is uh, just some JSON. It's very readable, very easy to set up and configure. And in fact, all our service owners that have seen the example we give them with most of the fields filled out, get it very quickly. Um, how is it managed? Every team is different. So as Connected Living is a pretty big, uh, TPX as a whole is enormous. There's a lot of diversity and variety in the way people uh, configure their projects. Some people do it as infrastructure as code. Some people put it in a secrets manager uh, and then just reference it from there. Some people put it just straight in a task definition. So what we want to do as a service mesh team is not um, be opinionated about how the other teams implement their work. Uh, Instead, we've chosen to take the approach of, let's just be flexible enough to support everybody. And we've seen the whole gamut from infrastructure as code, parameter store, and just straight configuration. So I hope that answers that question. All right, <clears throat> another Comcast question. Um, so are, is Comcast using console H HCP or managing console clusters internally in AWS? If managing internally in AWS, how are they? How are these clusters being managed? We're not using HCP. We're running our own clusters internally in AWS. Um, we're, you know, building immutable images and deploying them as we need to do updates. So we're using Packer, Terraform to deploy that stuff. It's in code. Um, we're also Base configuration, we're using the console Terraform plugin. So we're using Terraform to deploy our ACLs and tokens and update those 
and also to do some of the base configuration on the console clusters. So everything's in code from, from the base setup. All right, got another one for you guys. Um, so what are the biggest learnings uh, from running Envoy as sidecars in production? Um, could you share any gotchas or challenges that you guys encountered? Uh, the no, uh, no file U limit was huge. Um, uh, since we experienced a problem there, we've had a look at how console's configured, how many file handles it's um, configured to use per cluster, which is the Envoy term for uh, how it manages its traffic. So the U limit was probably the biggest gotcha and the easiest fix, right? Just change two values. Um, <clears throat> the um, any other gotchas? Um, I think, as Pete has mentioned, education. Uh, just getting people to think about instead of reaching out to a direct service somewhere else, talking to local hosts on a specific port. I know it doesn't sound like a big thing, but it's a little bit of mental gymnastics, especially when people also have to configure Envoy to say, hey, here's the port to talk to on local hosts. But the advantage, of course, is now that microservice no longer has to talk HTTPS to its destination, and it no longer has to have an HTTP listener of its own, including its own certificates which is a huge benefit. So getting people to do those mental gymnastics and to see the implications of having it um, has been probably the, the biggest thing. All right, um, and we also have a NIA related question. Um, are you currently using uh, console Terran from Sync uh, to do any network infrastructure automation or do you have any plans um, for that in the future? <laughs> We're currently not doing that in our environment. Um, I think we as a team don't have enough control over the networking portion to really do that. That's sort of handled by our, our cloud team. So we are not using the NIA product. Great, thank you. Um, so what types of considerations uh, did you have when deciding between uh, console and AWS uh, app mesh. Uh, separate question, what sort of hardening did you have to work through to take it from getting started to a production ready system that your teams are prepared to operate? So I'll, I'll take the first one and Pete, maybe you can take the, uh, the hardening aspect. Um, so uh, let me have a quick read of this. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. So, um, we produced a uh, detailed requirements document as a starting point, and this was nearly two years ago. Um, once we had that and we'd agreed on the criteria, uh, we then went and evaluated several products. Um, a lot of them did very well in the evaluation, uh, but there were a few knockout punches that were in console's favor. Uh, one of them being it's not opinionated on where it runs. Number two, it doesn't require Kubernetes for the control plane. That was a big deal for our team. Um, and it supports on-prem. In fact, console is just a single binary and it does everything. You tell it to launch as a server, you tell it to launch as a client. So we can run it anywhere. And for us, we felt reassured that we could launch on EC2 because we were very comfortable managing that infrastructure. And that of course it would support our other use cases, including running on Kubernetes as a sidecar. So that was kind of some of the bigger criteria that we uh, uh, hung our hat on. Uh, but I will say there's some really good products out there. Um, uh, they just didn't suit our use cases. What sort of hardening do we need to do to get it from getting started to production ready? Um, so we've, my team has had a lot of experience with console. We've used it for service discovery um, for a number of years. So we were comfortable operating console in production. However, the service mesh portion of that was brand new to us. So what we did was, I think a, a major portion of that was putting the labs together, like the research console with the Docker. So we really understood how it worked. I mean, we could, you know, I think, you know, some, some of the tutorials where you don't have like ACLs and policies, you know, it, it's a little hard to understand exactly how everything works. So we really kind of dove in and said, hey, let's make some labs for our teams that mimic what it's going to look like in production. So we worked through that. We also deployed it, you know, for testing in lower environments. 
And then we set up our own test services on it and um, war gamed it. We went through a number of different scenarios. What happens if this fails? What happens if that fails? How does this, how does it react? So we sort of set it, set up the whole thing with test services, uh, put it through the paces and made sure we understand how things fail when they fail. And that's how we got it ready. All right, next one. Um, are you using transparent proxy mode or explicitly specifying upstream dependencies? Uh, the latter, explicit. Um, do you have any plans to use the console templates for configuration management so that they can be dynamically updated? We've, we've looked at that a little bit. Um, there's some stuff around Datadog we want to make um, uh, configuration oriented, um, but we have a sort of a herding cats problem, right? Which is uh, the minute we add complexity to these JSON files, there's uh, opportunity for a service owner to make a mistake when they alter the configuration. And we can't manage all the configurations for all service owners, that doesn't scale. So we decided to go for a simple over sophisticated uh, and it's working for us so far. Um, what we're aiming to do is to have as much common configuration done using, um, uh, you know, the the, the cluster-wide configuration you've seen, say, like failover. That's worked out for us uh, pretty well so far. Um, and how is Comcast managing upstream configurations for service-to-service -service communication? Uh, so in two ways, first of all, the service owner that wants to have the upstream has to add it to their config file. So that, that's kind of a need. So that, that drive itself, which is good. Uh, but then the intentions need to uh, be enabled to allow that service to talk to the service. Uh, console UI is self-service. We issue everybody a management token along with their service token. So we've got a security posture there. The service token can connect to the mesh, send traffic. The management token the team uses to go and uh, maintain or manage their services in the console UI. Once they're in that console UI, they're allowed to grant and allow, so allow an intention from another service that needs access. At the moment, that uh, the counterparties have to talk to each other to go and enable that. Uh, in time, we have automation in our OneCloud portal, um, which Comcast has created as a proprietary uh, portal for multi-cloud management. Anyway. The long-term plan is to integrate that with uh, console so that that one cloud portal sends a command to console to allow intentions. So everything gets rolled together into one uh, UI eventually for that type of maintenance. All right, um, another sidecar question. So have you seen any impact to performance have, after having uh, sidecar proxies? So we've done some performance analysis in ECS Fargate. Um, I think it was a 24 hour run. We saw um, console and Envoy using a total of, I think like 38 megs, something like that. So even after that length run, it's still very much in control. Uh, CPU consumption, it depends on your vCPU configuration, but it was pretty low. The other thing to realize is Envoy does connection pooling. So that means it'll amortize the cost of a TLS, or in fact, in this case, an MTLS handshake with a counterparty. So you actually get better performance because there's connection pooling built in between the Envoy proxies. So we found it um, net equal. So we haven't seen any big impact, but there's some other advantages too. So for example, we're in the pro we, we've actually launched uh, a Datadog APM cluster um, as a core service. So now service owners no longer need to have that collector sitting alongside it. They can just go and use that port. And we're trying to work on um, moving data on metrics uh, in the same path by UDP. That's a little bit farther out. So adding these sidecars opens up possibilities to remove sidecars and have centralized uh, functions uh, for common um, horizontal capabilities, for example. And staying on the uh, topic of Envoy, so how do you manage console and Envoy upgrades? Is it a phased region by region process or is it all done at once? And does this require any sort of downtime? So one of the nice things that HashiCorp's done with console and Envoy 
is they've made it backwards compatible. So you don't have to upgrade your console on Envoy when we upgrade our server cluster. It's always backwards compatible. So we'll upgrade our server cluster, we'll produce new Docker, new Docker images, um, and it's up to service owners to go and literally pull that, put it into their ECR and change the task definitions. And they can do that on their own cadence. Um, we haven't experienced a situation where we require everybody to do an upgrade, but that would be the process. Um, and do you have any public test examples for your compost uh, setup? Uh, not at the moment. Um, uh, Nicholas Jackson also has some examples. We did ours from scratch because we wanted to really get into the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, but Nicholas Jackson has some examples that you can use. And I'm sure uh, Paul or Usha can comment on if there's any other um, you know, Docker Compose examples they can lean on. Yeah, not that not Docker Compose that I'm aware of. Um, we have Terraform, we have Helm charts for Kubernetes. Um, Um, and so in terms of setup, uh, is it one console uh, data center to one AWS region? And if that's the case, how do you resolve uh, duplicate service registrations across uh, AZSs? Uh, we are running one console data center per AWS region. And the, the services, exist fine in, in multiple regions there you know that's part of their their address is the region that they live in so there's no overlap there and no issues and then if you need to fail over to another region you know we handle that with the mesh gateways and with the routing configuration so you can have services in every region the data centers talk to each other over WAN so they know about each other yeah, and following on for that, um, the multi AZ statement. Um, so we do support services that are deployed in multiple AZs in the same region. Um, in fact, our server cluster, so our server nodes that make up our cluster are one per AZ uh, in a region. So we've got some resiliency there if a, an AZ goes down, or more likely a network link pops between an AZ. And actually, that happens more often than you'd think. It's usually that four or five seconds that will happen a couple times a day. Uh, so that's that's how we do our server cluster. When it comes to services, uh, consoles, gossip protocols, constantly probing other nodes within the region to say, are you reachable? And maybe they're not reachable from one perspective, but are reachable from the other two perspectives, in which case it's, the service is still considered online. But when it notices a service is completely unreachable, it'll automatically send new traffic to the good instances. So having a single service with the same name available in multiple AZs in the same region is actually beneficial. Now, the node names are different. That's how you can know that it's a distinct and different entity from the others. But the service itself, the service registration will appear and you'll have N instances and they'll be spread across multiple AZs. And that gives you a, a really good resiliency story. All right, I think we've reached our last question. Um, so do you have any strategies for ownership boundaries? Uh, naturally, this varies a lot between organizations, but lately uh, teams tend to own the development and operation of their service. The mesh adds a big fuzzy boundary. Uh, how do you think about that ownership in terms of on-call, development, priorities? So at Comcast, we follow a DevOps model. So the team that owns a service or wrote the service um, is monitoring and managing and looking after it. The service mesh, uh, every um, squad uh, onboards, and we do this through a CICD and some Terraform and some stuff, but essentially what happens is they pick a prefix. So CL for connected living dash, and then their service name, and then another dash. Everything after that they own. So in other words, they can have that prefix and they can launch any service they want using that prefix. And they've got uh, an ACL, so a token for that service that they can use to launch those services. We also have a management token that applies to that same prefix. So we've created effectively a namespace for each squad for the services that they run. In terms of management, uh, the team that owns that uh, prefix looks after those services. 
So if team A has a problem with contacting or working with team B's services, they can talk to team B and team B has the authorization to go and allow intentions or deny intentions. So we've got namespacing and ownership down to the squad level to give people autonomy uh, to act. When it comes to the core service, um, so the server clusters, terminating gateways, mesh gateways, and so on and so forth, uh, Pete, myself, and the rest of the team have uh, standard on-call uh, rotors and support procedures and runbooks for that. Um, uh, so it's no different, in a sense, from running an API gateway or running a, a core backend uh, service. Uh, we do have to support it, but uh, individual teams have granularity and autonomy to manage their own services. Awesome. We have one last question that just came in. Um, so in, in terms of API gateway, um, what are you guys using? Uh, we can't talk about other vendor products on a HashiCorp call. Um, <laughs> I was told that at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, we're not using the um, HashiCorp uh, Console Connect uh, ingress gateway. Uh, and it's not because it's a bad product. It's a good product. Uh, it's because we started the API gateway journey four years ago long before we started the service mesh journey. So we have something that works um, uh, and that's all I can really say. <laughs> all right, well, that concludes our Q&A. Um, Gordon, Peter, thank you so much for your time and for uh, you know, spending this morning with us and answering all of these great questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this session will be recorded. So, um, you know, uh, you, you guys can rewatch it at your leisure. Um, and thank you everyone as well for attending. Um, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>